can we do this again and invite my kids? <laughs> really? They could care less. I thought that was very impressive, that fellow, you know? Wow. I'd like to meet him someday. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so glad the Apologetics Con Conference of the Desert has moved into the big room. Oh, yeah. This is where you deserve to be all along. So th thanks for populating all the pews and enjoying this. Uh, so Mike Winger, he's okay. <laughs> Do you like Mike? You know, I, I just met him for the first time. I've seen him on YouTube as well, and I was really thrilled to uh, finally meet him and hear him speak. Uh, now, what you don't know is what he did before he was a YouTuber and such, right? He had a little stint as a children's book author. Oh, yeah. You can check this on Amazon, you know. Those books didn't do so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, his first book, it, it got off to a small start. You know, it was uh, Power Tools, Blow Torches, and Saws, an I Can Do It book. That didn't do well, so he wrote another one. It was called Some Kittens Can Fly. <laughs> Again, not a good story. The next one actually did quite well. Uh, Curious George and the High Voltage Fence. <clears throat> <laughs> then he sunk the whole operation when he wrote, You are different, and that's bad. So, so I'm glad he went into apologetics. I think he's doing a bang-up job. Uh, <laughs> None of that is true. Please don't waste your time and, and, and cell phone battery checking these out on. Oh, I've got to get that flying kitten one. Yeah, don't, don't want to do that. Oh, hey, uh, I brought some books, quick commercial. Uh, some of you have seen these before. Uh, this is my latest one called Fearless Prayer, Why We Don't Ask and Why We Should. This is a book about one particular troublesome and interesting Bible verse, uh, John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for anything and it will be done for you. What does that mean? Really? Uh, by the way, so this book is devoted to the idea that Jesus actually meant that. And so I'll leave it to you to discover it. And it's, it's one of the most exciting things I've had in my Christian life is kind of discovering that and then writing on it. Another book I wrote called Five Sacred Crossings. This will be like the book for my lecture today. Uh, all, all that I'll be teaching you will be contained in this book. And it's a novel, weirdly. It's a fast-paced mystery story uh, with a bunch of true stuff about Christianity plunked down in the middle, unlike The Da Vinci Code, which was fast-paced mystery story with a bunch of ridiculous things about Christianity plunked down in the middle of it. But I think you'll enjoy this. I bumped into the acquisitions editor who first recruited me to do this book uh, years ago. And he stopped me in the halls of a conference. He goes, I've got to tell you, that Five Sacred Crossings may be the best book our publishing house ever did. Now, it didn't sell like that, but he, as the editor, <laughs> thought that that was... So I, I take that for what it's worth, but it was my favorite thing to write as well. I brought a book written by Lee Strobel called The Case for Grace. I will be mentioning grace and how that's a significant feature that sets Christianity apart from the pack. And uh, so Lee wrote a book on grace. And the only reason I'm carrying this around is because he featured me in chapter four. You see, this is a book about low lives and people who just, you know, really failed at life and who had tremendous trouble. And by God's grace, they overcame all of these wonderful things and, and, and now they're living lives to the glory of God. Uh, so he included me in chapter four, right between the executioner and the drug addict. <laughs> I'll let you figure out why I'm in there. You know. Oh, I won't, I won't talk about it. A couple of great DVDs. I just won't talk about them now. And, and a wonderful book. I'm going to be talking about some religions you may not know much about. This is called World Religions and Cults 101. I was the, uh, the contributing uh, editor to this book when it, was, when it first came out. So I carry this one around too. In fact, they used to have a, in an earlier edition, they had a cartoon figure of me in the book, you know, pointing out special facts for people. I'm kind of glad they moved away from that. Uh, <laughs> But I will be mentioning a number of religions, and some of you may be thinking, wow, well, you know, I've heard of Islam, and I know about Buddhism, but I don't really know what they teach or what they stand for. So this is a wonderful little first-step summary 
of movements like that. All right, more on all this later. Uh, one more quick commercial. I run a Master of Arts degree in Christian apologetics at Biola University. Uh, I was usually, sometimes I was reluctant to talk about that program once I moved out of the Los Angeles sphere of influence because getting into Los Angeles is such a difficult thing, you know, uh, if you have to drive in the afternoon, for instance. It's just brutal. But we now have a fully and a wonderful fully distance program that you can do the, you can do the MA degree from the place like uh, this beautiful spot of the country without ever having to get on a freeway. But you can also come to campus anytime you'd like to take classes there if that fits your need. So we have a, an MA in Christian apologetics and you don't have to have a background in the subject matter. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree in biblical studies or theology or philosophy or anything like that. We'll give you everything you need to master these ideas. Uh, we'll give you everything you need to make a nuisance of yourself or Jesus in all kinds of new and exciting ways. So consider that. And by the way, I don't think you're too old or too young or too this or that, because this looks like our classrooms, you know. And so I think you'll really enjoy it. And some of our graduates, we're just so thrilled to see how the Lord is using them. Uh, in fact, uh, our program has been so successful, we actually, actually spawned our own competition. There's schools all over the country now doing master's degrees in Christian apologetics, and now they're our nemesis. You know, we, you know, we used to serve the Lord together. Now they're competing with us. So. No, we're thrilled. That's, that's a great honor that, that people are imitating our program. So consider that. Even if you have a, you know, your bachelor's degree is in accounting or something, it's, it's convenient, it's affordable, and it's open to everybody. And uh, the people who go through the program are just thrilled. I mean, it's fun to see people who just come out of various careers that have nothing to do with philosophy or theology or biblical studies or cultural studies and, and suddenly you ramp it up. And now they're, you know, wonderful writers and platform speakers and all kinds of things. All right. Uh, so here we are. In a church, I mean, there's stained glass, there's a the whole thing going on. So if a secular reporter were to walk in here and look around and go, ha, huh, look, the faithful have gathered at our Savior's church. Maybe you, maybe you hear those words when uh, you flip on the evening news around Easter time and, the, and there's throngs of uh, Christians in St. Peter's Square. They always get a, a camera shot of that and and the, the news anchor will say something like, you know, the faithful have gathered in St. Peter's Square this evening to do whatever it is those weirdos do. You know, uh, That's what they really mean, though. When the faithful gather, you know what they mean by faithful? The people who believe a bunch of weird stuff that you can't prove. I'm not kidding. I mean, how many of you have had this kind of experience? You, you actually bring your Bible to work right? Because you know what? You get a little break. You want to do like a little devotional time. You keep it in a drawer out of the way, but one time you forgot to put it back in the drawer, you know, and some coworker wanders by, <laughs> sees it out of the corner of his eye, whips around and goes, oh, a Bible. Ha! Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, well, you know what? Good for you. Good for you. You know what good for you means, don't you? It, it means, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you need that kind of thing to make it through the day. I, on the other hand, am, am more immersed in real thinking and science and so on. Whereas you're out there embracing fairy tales and, you know, and myths and that kind of stuff. So, oh, that just grieves me because I, I, did, I did my doctoral work in religious studies, yeah, comparing all the great world religious traditions. And I discovered that Christianity stands apart from the pack in rather a dramatic way. And it's a way that you wouldn't think of immediately. Certainly those reporters looking at St. Peter's Square at Easter time wouldn't be thinking that. Well, there's all the faithful people who, who worship Christ, who made it a big deal to have a strong trail of evidence down through history testifying that this is all true. You know, that doesn't make it into their report, but that's the kind of a God we serve. And he set it up that way on purpose so that we could know the truth, not just hope for the truth, not just feel the truth, but to know the truth. Christianity is a knowledge tradition. We're, we're big about knowing things. Let me, let me give you an example of this. This is, a, this is from an 
op-ed piece in the Los Angeles Times a few years ago. There's an engineering professor at the University of Southern California. His name is Bart Costco, and he's a decided atheist. And, and the, the city government in Los Angeles was going to give some money to some faith-based organizations in order to do some good in the community. Well, this really rankled Bart Costco, the confirmed atheist. Uh, and so he decided he was going to write a letter to the editor of the LA Times complaining about this. And the LA Times dutifully published his little tirade. Um, but listen to this. This is what Bart Costco, engineering professor at the University of Southern California, says in his letter, because he has to actually say what faith is in order to make his point. So he has a little paragraph on it. Here it is. Ready? Faith is unwarranted belief. Faith is belief without evidence or despite evidence to the contrary. Faith occurs when a person believes that something is true, even though he suspects it's false. It takes large doses of such faith to support the very existence of casinos, psychic hotlines, astrology columns in newspapers, mall Santas at Christmas, and most organized religions. I didn't sign up for that. What is he talking about? Well, uh, you see, to him, faith, here's a definition of faith for Bart Costco. Faith is blind leaping. It's blind leaping. So what, I mean, his idea is faith is these, these Christians who want something to be meaningful in their eyes will walk out to the edge of the religious abyss. They'll close their eyes and they'll just leap. And that's what it's all about. But we don't want to make decisions about city government and how to serve the poor and so on based on that kind of ridiculousness. We want, we want knowledge behind it. So they believe that at the core of our activities as Christians, is this blind leaping operation. There's no knowledge in it. You can, I mean, and there's many crazy religions out there to choose. Most people in America choose Christianity. And so this really rankles Bart Costco. Is that what we signed up for? Yeah, I think not. So, all right, uh, shift gears. I did my doctoral work at, in, in, at UC Santa Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> Go gauchos. Go gauchos. I never, I never understood why the school mascot was a pair of women's pants. <laughs> Figure that out. This was an amazing opportunity for me as a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christian to get a chance to study all of the great world religious traditions. You know, Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and Native American traditions and Mormonism and stuff you never heard of and stuff that was being invented on street corners in Los Angeles at the moment. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, but really, I, I, I was thrilled to study this because ever since I became a Christian as a senior in high school... Uh, one of the big questions in my mind was, what about those other religions? I really don't know much about them, and I, I think Christianity is true. I mean, the evidence seems really strong for it, but I feel a little insecure because I haven't studied some of the others. So I think this is kind of an outworking of that little puzzle going on in my mind. Uh, so it didn't take long uh, to discover that Christianity is uh, a bit strange. In fact, let me, let me boil it down for you. Not everybody in here is going to get a chance to go to the University of California and study under some of the top scholars in the world in Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and so on. So let me, let me boil it down. As a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christian, how did all that uh, look to me? Christianity's weird. No, really, we signed up for a very strange religion. I mean, if there's a box called religion right here, here's a box called religion, and uh, and you, uh, yeah, there's a, well, there's a box, and and you want to drop religion into the box. So I got the religion here, I got the box here, and you drop it. In. It doesn't go in the box, right? Now you can saw some pieces off, and you can you can push a little harder, and it still doesn't go in the box. It's it's like a cat. Have you ever tried to put a cat in a box? You know, you're kidding. You know, it won't go in the box. That's the way Christianity is with the concept of religion. It doesn't fit it very well at all. Uh, and, so, and so that puzzled me. Why does Christianity seem like such a bad fit for the category we call religion? Well, it's got some features that just don't fit the 
package at all. In fact, I'm, and I want to go over some of those, but let, let me start out with one right out, right off, right out of the chute. And it's this. Uh, Christianity, as opposed to all the other great religious traditions, is testable. It's testable. That may not be the best philosophical term to use, but it, it works on a popular level. You can, what I mean by testable is you can offer evidence for it, you can offer evidence against it, and the evidence actually means something. In other words, you can make, you can make decisions about whether to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ or not based on the evidence in the case. Well, maybe you're thinking, well, can't you do that with other religions? Well, no, not really. They don't lend themselves to that much at all. Now, there are some religions that sound like they uh, lend themselves to investigation. But when you, when you actually get a little closer and uh, poke and prod a little bit, it turns out that they don't really at all. I, I would put Mormonism in that category. Uh, one of my areas of specialty is Mormonism, and uh, some of you probably know something about it. It's where if the missionaries are coming to your door, right, you kind of you kind of look forward to it because you're gonna have a you're gonna have a robust little dialogue with the with the 19 year old white shirt guys, you know, and and so they 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 come up to your house and they knock and oh, I shouldn't divert this, but it's too juicy. Uh, so the more missionaries came to my house, one time my my wife was out uh, working in the yard. Yeah, my wife's a beautiful woman, and on this particular occasion, she was just covered in mud, and her glasses were like uh, cockeyed. She couldn't fix them because her hands were too muddy. And two guys on bicycles and white shirts and black name tags uh, come up, and uh, she sees them, and they start to talk to her. She's like, Greg, your friends are here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go downstairs, and, and the more missionaries are like, oh, hello, I'm Elder so-and-so. And Elder, like, hey, great, great to see you guys. And I looked at my wife, and she's like, boy, you know, Eyeglasses are still just barely hanging onto her head. Uh, and those shorts, I don't know where she is. She pulled them out of the gardening shed, you know? And so, so I go, guys, look, I'll save you some time. I could never become a Mormon. And they're like, that's weird. I mean, why would you say that just now? I go, well, um, you guys, uh, I would have to be married to this woman forever. <laughs> now, I waited for a second to see if I was just going to get chased with gardening shears, or if she's going to laugh. Ah, she laughed. <laughs> so the Mormons come to your door. Now, you've studied up on this. And you, so you look at, you're looking forward to it. You bring them in. You begin to chat with them about things. And they tell you a story that seems like it has testability written all over it. You know, there was a man named Joseph Smith, a Latter-day prophet of God, who was uh, told by a particular angel to go up in a local hill and dig and find some gold plates, which would be written in reformed Egyptian characters. Bring those down, and then by the gift and power of God, you will be able to translate those things into modern English. You will publish the Book of Mormon and really uh, restore the lost church. You know, Now, there sounds like the sounds to me like there's a lot of testable material in there, a lot of things that could be investigated. But what happens when you start asking the Mormon missionaries, or in my case, I've asked people at all levels, you know, the local bishops and local stake presidents and, and general authorities of the church. I've asked this to several apostles, and uh, I've, got, I've got at least two apostles on speed dial. So I, I'm, I've got some in here. And of course, a whole range of Brigham Young University professors about this. And every time this, the move is the same, once you bring up some difficult questions about those issues, they kind of take a step back and go, well, don't know what to do with all that stuff. But you have to understand, I have had a feeling in my heart that this is true. You see how it sounded like it was testable? Like you'd actually do some historical investigation, but then poop, you know, they take a step back and it, it has nothing really to do with it. What, has, what it has to do with a feeling inside of them. A classic burning of the bosom, they call it in religious uh, history. Uh, another one, that, there's another group that's really up front with the idea that they are they are not interested in doing an investigation. That would be Zen Buddhism. They think I'm a crazy person be, because I'm even interested in such a thing. The only thing is a Zen Buddhist is really interested in is, is moving inwardly toward enlightenment. And honestly, the, the kind of rationality and interest in investigation and facts and so on is, are actually blockages or impediments in the pathway toward uh, enlightenment. 
So most, some religions are really upfront with the idea about that they don't want anything to do with investigation, facts, rationality. Some sound like they do a little bit, but once you poke and prod, it doesn't really work out very well. Uh, so let me do this. Let me, let me read something from some religious literature uh, to highlight something. But listen to this. I consider this passage, by the way, that I'm going to read to you, the strangest passage in all of religious literature. You're not going to find something like this in the Bhagavad Gita or the Buddhist Tripitaka or the Quran or the Book of Mormon. This comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verses, uh, verses 12 through 19. I'll just read it to you, see if you can figure out why I would call this one of the strangest passages in all of religious literature. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. Really? And he continues, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, uh, but he did not raise him, if in, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, empty, worthless would be synonyms there and you're still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why would I call that one of the strangest passages in all of relig religious literature? Because it's madness. What was he thinking? The apostle Paul really blew it on this one, right? He, you know what he did? He hung Christianity by a thread. Shh. This thread. And uh, invited people to bring a pair of nice sharp shears in to snip that thing and see it come crashing down. That's madness. You don't do that if you're going to start a new religion. <laughs> I, I used to plan starting my own religion in boring seminars in graduate school, you know. How would I do it? And I certainly wouldn't do this. In fact, I'd set it up so that, uh, oh, there's knowledge, all right, but it all comes from me. And I dole it out at little bits at a time for large sums of money, you see. Um, <laughs> But to lay it out there like, oh, here, guys, you know, come snip this thing. No. Now, it turns out that that thread is made out of some super titanium alloy that breaks any pair of scissors that gets near it. Uh, in fact, I mean, I'm always tempted at this point to start launching into a, a, a presentation on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus because it is stunningly good. I love talking about the resurrection of Jesus and the evidence for that on secular college campuses more than any other topic because it blows their mind. They're just not expecting it. You know, lecture tonight on resurrection of Jesus. They think they're going to go be hearing me talk about my faith experience. Ah, oh, I love Jesus and he made me feel better about this, 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 and this, you know? Unless I'm a progressive Christian and then I feel better about lots of more things. <laughs> uh, So uh, you don't do that. You don't hang it by a thread. But the Apostle Paul did. You know why? It, it makes perfect sense when you actually think about this. He saw the resurrected Jesus. He was very confident that he was alive again. So he could, he could actually make such a statement. And he was very confident in God the Father that he would protect the evidence as it made its way down through history and sits before us right now. Uh, we've got the goods on this. I, I believe that that... That the resurrection of Jesus is the best attested fact of the ancient world. I believe that it's, it's a done deal. It's knowable history that Jesus uh, died at the hands of a Roman crucifixion team uh, and, and then uh, three days later came back from the dead. He was, uh, he was uh, alive, he was dead, and then he was alive again. I think that is knowable history. Uh, guess what? Other religions don't have that going for them. Uh, God really wants us to know this to be true. He wants, he wants us to know that Jesus came back to life again. And those of us who put our faith in Christ, we too will live forever. I mean, that's what he wants us to know so that we're bold, even in the face of death. Why do you think Christianity spread in the earliest days? Because uh, the earliest 
followers of Jesus saw him alive again. And they didn't mind going out into the world and proclaiming this, knowing that they would be doing it uh, at the sacrifice of their lives in many occasions. So testability, Christianity is testable. That's something that sets it apart in rather dramatic fashion from the other great world religious traditions. I want to talk about a few other things that sets Christianity apart from the pack. And uh, I'll do this by telling you a story. It's kind of an extended story where I, I, the Lord was doing some teaching to me about all of these ideas. And some of this is actually contained in uh, the novel Five Sacred Crossings. It's not the same story. I've developed a whole different novel, but a lot of the original ideas respond at this particular point. All right. I was minding my own business in my Biola University office. The phone rings. I pick up the phone. It's the university operator transferring a call to my line. At the other end of the line was a teaching assistant from some local community college near the beach in Orange County. And uh, this teaching assistant was an assistant for a, a world religion survey class at a community college. And they were looking for speakers uh, or really just, just adherence to various religions to come in and speak directly to the students as representatives of their religion so the students could have kind of firsthand contact with people who believed in Buddhism and Hinduism and so on. You know. Well, uh, now this part I'm actually imagining. So the, the teaching assistants got together at the local community college with, with the professor and they're, they're deciding what they should do for the end of the term speaker list. You know, and they go, okay, we got our Buddhist, we got our, we got our Hindu guy, uh, we, and we got, a, we got a Catholic already. What we need is we need a fundamentalist Christian. That's what we need. And so uh, uh, the, the professor says that, and one of the teaching assistants goes, well, for goodness sakes, where do you find them? <laughs> and another teaching assistant goes, by all the university, it's crawling with them. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so to the phone, and they rush off to the phone. And they dial up uh, Biola University. Now, this part's kind of real. You know, they dial up Biola University. The university operator answers, hello, Biola University. How may I direct your call? Hello, we're looking for a fundamentalist, please. One moment. And it comes to my office. You know. <clears throat> I hear what they're doing. And I'm actually excited to go down and talk to this class. It, it, it sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, but it, the guy on the other end of the line was just obsessed with fundamentalism. Yeah, you know, you uh, we want a fundamentalist. You're a fundamentalist, right? Well, you know, uh, depend. He didn't want any explanation. Like, blah, 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 do you want to do it or not? You know, you're a fundamentalist, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm a fundamentalist. I'll, I'll come talk to your people. Uh, but he said, this this actually surprised me more than anything. He said, all right, great. All we need we need you to show up at 8:30 at this particular building on the campus next Wednesday, 8:30 in the morning for an elective class at a community college. I don't think that's going to be uh, well populated. But it turns out that this is a very popular thing to study because a lot of students just grow up wondering about these world religions. Uh, the professor must be some sort of early bird. He offers the class early. Students come in because it's a, it's a great way to earn some units and actually study something they're interested in. So I get there and I walk in and the, the room is bigger than I expected. You know, actually a small lecture hall. And uh, students were just starting to arrive. Uh, I totally expect them to be pretty bleary-eyed that early in the morning, you know, and so they were shuffling in, you know, carrying gigantic cups of coffee. So I knew it might just be a little while before that stuff, you know, kicks in. Uh, the, teach, the teaching assistant sees me. I obviously, well, I kind of look like a community college student, just a little. And he goes, uh, hello, uh, and he introduces himself. And so I said, hey, great. Uh, he gave me some of the ground rules. And I said, hey, I'd love to meet the professor. Is he or she here? And the guy goes, uh, yeah, he's here. I go, well, where, where is he? And he goes, over there. Now, I don't know why. It just sticks in my mind. Why wasn't the guy using his hand like the point? You know, so like, yeah. <laughs> and it turned out not to be any reason, but there was a man sitting at the very end of, you know, these were desks that fold up and over, and he, had a, and he was like kind of like out of it. I go, so that guy, he goes, uh, yeah, yeah. I go, he, uh, is he, is he sick? <laughs> and the guy goes, no, no. I got the backstory later. It turns out towards the end of the term when this professor uh, uh, brings in guest speakers, he doesn't have any preparation to do. And so he, you know, kind of turns it over to the TAs. And he just kind of shows up and sleeps it off in the corner because he goes out drinking and chasing girls most of the night. 
And uh, so he was, he was kind of out of it. Uh, so uh, then, the, then the TA gave me an introduction. And I don't remember what he said, but I remember what it felt like, you know? And it, it felt like, here is Craig Hazen. He, his education most likely consisted of memorizing Bible verses <laughs> at Bill's Bible College and Feedlot, you know? Something like that. That's what it, that's what it felt. And so, so, so he walks off and sits down after that strange and, strange and very short introduction. This guy's sleeping it off. And I get this idea. I get this idea that I have free reign in the classroom. Oh so, wow. <laughs> You're, you, you think I, like, threw a Molotov cocktail in the middle? <laughs> so, um, Where was I? Uh, so then, oh, so I said, hey, students, uh, glad you're here. And so, I mean, I'm here. My assignment is to give you a lecture on the modern American fundamentalist movement. And I'm okay with that. I actually know something about it. But I got to tell you, on the way driving down here, I'm thinking, you know, those students really, they probably won't want to hear something on fundamentalism. Uh, because I, I bet a lot of them are going to be in that class uh, because they're taking out various religions for a little test drive, you know? How does, how does Buddhism accelerate? How does Islam handle in the curves? And so they're just get, using this as a, as a kind of a secular college opportunity to get to know something about religions that they're curious about. And uh, so what I thought about doing is taking you on a little journey. How would, a, how would a thoughtful person like you go about a proper religious quest? How, how would you sort through all the options and pick the one that's really best for you? you know? Oh, man, it's like the Starbucks was kicking in right there because they're like, Whoa? what did he say? Oh, yeah, we should do that. That other thing's terrible. You know? oh, yeah, let's do the, do the questy thing. I let, he's still asleep, teach, teaching assistants don't really care. So I'm like, uh, okay, then uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, okay, here you are, you're studying all kinds of important stuff, you engage your mind all the time. How would you engage your mind about the various religion, religious options before you? Uh, so, if, now, if you're, if, if you're a thoughtful person and you're on some sort of religious quest, it, it makes perfect sense to me that you ought to start that quest with Christianity. That was exactly the sound in the class. <laughs> Tumbleweeds. You know. And then there was a guy who was sitting dead center in the back of the room. I remember it like yesterday. I line up with him. He's right there. And he, right, again, I don't know what it is about arms in this class, but he raises his hand in a weird way. He goes. Because <laughs> he was actually leaning back in his chair. And he kind of. And I call him. And he says. Uh, and he, he said. He uh, said. And by the way, he was, he was like a long-haired surfer guy, lo local surfer boy, who turned out he was a little smarter than he looked, you know? <laughs> he was sitting next to two other surfer guys. They were no smarter than they looked. But this guy in the middle, he said, he goes, uh, hey, did everybody see that? Um, hey, now, so, like, uh, I thought you weren't going to give us a lecture on fundamentalism, but the first thing you say is you gotta, you got to follow my religion because it's best. What's that about? Said, oh, well, that's a, that's a good question, you know. It, it showed me that people were alive and kicking and ready, ready to go. I go, well, let me do this then. Good, good point. Let me, let me give you five reasons why. Five reasons why a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity. <laughs> I had no idea if I had five. <laughs> I was pretty sure I had two, you know. Uh, but, you know, come on, Jesus. <laughs> give, me, give me the rest of them. By the way, five things and uh, five sacred crossings. They, they are related. That's where I got all, most of these ideas. So, great. Let me, so let me give you number one. The first reason that a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity is that Christianity is testable. I've already talked to you here in this building about that. And uh, I added a few things. I read them that 1 Corinthians 15 passage, but then I asked, I, I said to them, look, and your time is very valuable. So, um, the thing is, Christianity hangs, is hung by the thread of the resurrection. And so if you focus your investigation there, you can actually make some decisions about whether that is plausible or reasonable to believe. And that might take you, I don't know, seven hours. 
seven days, seven weeks, 70 years. I don't know, but it's, it is in principle investigatable and you can make decisions based on that investigation. So that's a good reason to think about Christianity first. The, the students were a little more impressed with that reasoning when I told them what, what they would have to go through in Buddhism. I said, now, if you're going to, if you want to know the basic truth about Buddhism, you know, uh, is nirvana real or something like that, which is actually a nonsensical Buddhist question. But nonetheless, um, if you want to know something about the, the reality of Buddhism, uh, well, I asked a senior Mahayana teacher one time, and he's very excited that I asked the question, how long does it take? How many trips on the wheel of samsara, that is birth, death, and rebirth, will it take before you're finally liberated and you know, fully experience nirvana, right? And he goes, oh, that would be something like one times 10 to the 60th power of lifetimes, right? I don't know if you're a little rusty on your scientific notation, one times 10 to the 60th power is, is I don't know the name of the number, but it's one with 60 zeros attached to it. Uh, that's a lot of lifetimes, that's going to keep you very busy for a very long time. So if you're a thoughtful person, it makes a lot of sense to start with the religion that you can actually investigate in a finite amount of time. Make some decisions, yay or nay, and move on. So students, the students actually like the testability thing. They're like, what else you got? Like, okay. Uh, second reason that a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity is that in Christianity, salvation is a free gift from God. Salvation is a free gift from God. And I read in that passage in Ephesians chapter two, uh, verses eight and nine, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not the result of works that no one should boast. I remember reading that to him and looking up and thinking that that would have some impact, but they're like, huh. Unfortunately, secular students today aren't, you read the Bible to them, it just has almost no impact. There's just no, there's no basis, common basis anymore for uh, biblical ideas and language. So I had to, I had to resort to a different way to present this, but, but these were college students. They did understand the concept of free, you know? So, so I, you know, I mentioned, yay, it's kind of like getting a free haircut or a free sandwich or a free music download or something like that. So that, that helped a little bit. But then I, I just repackage the story of, well, the parable of the prodigal son. And it actually did wonders. I talked about this young man who took, took his father's inheritance, kind of, you know, blew off his family, went to a far country and started blowing that money like there's no tomorrow on wine, women, and song. Dad was pretty stressed out and de-stressed about the whole thing. Uh, but the kid even had, had it worse when the money ran out and, uh, and a famine hits the land. The kid can't get work. He has to eat the, eat the slop the pigs are eating. So he, he shakes it all off. The text says he actually comes to his senses. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And he goes, oh, what, what am I doing? I had, it, I had the life at dad's place. And now look at me. The only recourse he had was maybe to trudge back to dad and, and see what might happen. So he turns towards home and takes that long walk of repentance back. When he gets towards his father's home. Dad's sitting out on the porch one day, and this guy was pretty rich. And he sees the kid way off, way in the corner of the property, walking along the road that borders their home. And uh, as the kid gets closer, the father squints and he goes, oh, it's my son. Now, when Jesus is telling this parable, uh, the crowd was ready to say, yeah, dad's going to hammer this kid, you know? <laughs> but Jesus doesn't go there with the story. Uh, he has the father, you know, uh, in my embellishment, leaping off of the porch in a very undignified way and running to the boy, you know, throwing his arms around him, kissing his neck and calling his servants to bring a cloak and, and a ring for his finger and killing the fatted calf because we're feasting tonight. My son was lost and now he's found. And I made the point to the students, I go, you will not find a picture of the love of God for us in any religion on the planet today or throughout human history that's unique to Christianity. I dare you, go look it up. Try to find something that comes even close to that. But that's the free gift of salvation we're talking about in Christianity. The third reason that I've that a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity is that with Christianity, you get an amazing worldview fit. An amazing worldview fit. 
What I mean by that is Christianity paints a picture of the world that matches the way the world really is. It paints a picture of the world that matches the way the world really is. I thought I was pretty clever bringing that one up in front of the class, you know. I'd ventured out of the two that I knew and thrown out a third. Well, that, uh, I knew there might be a few flaws in it, but the sk and skateboard guy in the back, he caught it immediately. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, so how are you going to demonstrate that exactly, he says, you know. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of facts in the world that you got to line up with, and uh, it doesn't seem to me you've started with any. I go, you know, that's a very good point. That is a tall order. I mean, I run a master's degree program in Christian apologetics, and it's like we barely scratched the surface on all the things that could be presented that need to match up with the world. But let me give you one, one really important one, uh, one that we all experience and one that we all have to deal with. And it's the problem uh, in human experience of evil, pain, and suffering. How does Christianity deal with that? And how do, say, the, the Eastern religious traditions deal with evil, pain, and suffering? And... Uh, so I said, yeah, you've been in this class all along. I bet, you, I bet you've run into this issue as you've studied Eastern religious traditions. In Eastern religious traditions, the way you deal with evil, pain, and suffering, uh, there might be some nuances here and there, but by and large, the move that is made in Eastern religious traditions is to, is to call evil, pain, and suffering something new. You call it maya. Maya, a, a Sanskrit term for illusion. You basically have to assimilate deeply the idea that evil, pain, and suffering is illusory. It's not real. And it takes a lot of practice throughout your life to, to get to that point. And I must say, I don't think people really ever get there. But that's, that's the move. Uh, so I told, and the students said, yeah, that sounds fairly reasonable. I go, well, let me give you an example here. Say, say the door's open in the back of the class and in walks an elderly woman. She's got a shock of gray hair and she's got a cane and a little limp. And she walks down the middle of the class and she, she takes a seat right here in the front row. Well, we don't get classroom invasions by, you know, gray-haired women very often. So we, we, we pause and say, madam, what's your story? And this gal doesn't hesitate for a second. She turns to the class and in a thick Polish accent tells about uh, her family and her village in Nazi-occupied Poland when German troops come in and start rounding people up to haul, haul them off to concentration camps, you know? They had them packed little suitcases like they were actually going on a little trip. And they threw the suitcases in one boxcar and stuffed the people in another. They stuffed them in so tightly that even if you were to die or fall asleep, you wouldn't hit the ground. Could you imagine how horrific that would be in a hot summer month with no water and no facilities and people dying and... Uh, Misery on wheels, truly. And these things chug off to the, uh, the camps. And they land and they open the doors and they're, they're actually throwing dead bodies off already. And uh, the suitcases just go in a big truck. They'll be gone through later for, for valuable items. And then they separate people. There's a big camp over here, a big area of the camp with smokestacks going day and night. We know what was happening over there. Smaller camp over here where they thought people were healthy enough or had some physical attributes that would help them work. And so they, they shoved them over there. This elderly woman was just a girl at the time and she got thrown over into the work camp. The rest of her family, the rest of her village, she never saw them again. So she's working day and night and she's getting smaller by the day because she's just not getting enough nourishment and it's really hideous and horrific. Fortunately for her, before she succumbs to starvation, uh, the Red Army sweeps in and liberates the camp. That's when Russians used to do good things with their army. You know. um, so they, they, they swoop in and they liberate the camp. And here's this, here's this little girl wearing rags, nearly starved to death, and somehow she picks herself up, dusts herself off, and marches down through the decades, and she stands here before the class today telling this gripping tale of the Holocaust. What are you going to say to her? Are you going to say, cheer up, lady. Turn that frown upside down. Just think happy thoughts, and the world will be your oyster. Is that what you're going to say to her? In other words, just call it Maya. Assume it's an illusion. Brush it off the table and move on with your life. No, that's horrific. We all know what evil, pain, and suffering is, and that is not uh, going to solve anything. It's real. How do Christians, by and large, deal with evil, pain, and suffering? Well, we know it's real. 
In fact, our great calling as Christians is to leap down into the trenches where people are suffering and bear them up the best we can in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself suffered dramatically. And we worship a God who recognizes evil, pain, and suffering. And he has promised one day to wipe away every tear and to correct every moment of injustice. Now that is painting a picture of the world the way the world really is. Certainly Eastern traditions paint a picture of the world, but it is completely askew. So I want to I want a religious I I want to I want to follow a religion that actually gets things right that matches the way the world really is as it's presented to all of us. I'm not going to give you number four because uh, it takes too long. It's a little bit more technical, but I'll give you the answer so you could write it in there. And the answer to number four is you get to live a non-compartmentalized life. You get to live a non-compartmentalized life. Uh, this, this, I'll get the, the quick version of this is, uh, this was meant to uh, address all of the Asian students in the room who come from traditions that, that seem to think uh, Eastern religious traditions are much more holistic. I make the case they are not at all holistic. In fact, if you adhere to an Eastern religious tradition, by and large, you live in two worlds. The everyday world where rationality, evidence, analysis, facts, and so on apply moment by moment. And then the religious sphere where those things are all impediments to your forward progress in religion. So you actually have to live in two worlds. That is a, a dramatic compartmentalization. Christianity brings those two spheres together. We actually bring our analysis and our logic and our clear thinking. Uh, we bring it into our worship and into our communion with God. Well, we worship Jesus, who is the logos, the word or the reason of God. Uh, we read a Bible that has an Isaiah saying, you know, come let us reason together. Uh, this is all part and parcel of Christianity. It comes together and we're not, we're not separating out the spheres. I'll leave that one there because I want to get to number five, the last one. Uh, in fact, let me give the setup for this. So I'm, I'm going along and I'm thinking it's going pretty good. The students seem fairly engaged, uh, but I, nobody told me when to quit, you know, like what my stop time was. And that guy was, he's still sleeping it off over there. Teaching assistants, they're just kind of, you know, well, their iPhones didn't exist at the time, I don't think, but they, I don't know what they were doing, but they weren't, they weren't signaling me to stop. But I did notice something. There was a door over here in the, in the lecture hall with a little window in it. And there was a professor looking fellow looking through the window, tapping on his watch. <laughs> so that was a pretty good signal. Like, and, and the students in the class, I could tell that they were just starting to like gather up their things, putting in the backpack. And I go, oh, we are getting near the end here. I got, all right, hey, all right, everybody, hang in there. Uh, let me give you one last thing, the fifth and final reason why a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity. And it's this. Christianity has Jesus at the center. Christianity has Jesus at the center. Uh, what's funny, I remember the students' faces, they're kind of packing up, and then they look up and they go, huh, okay. And they keep packing, you know. And, and this, the door opens over here. The professor walks in, students are behind him. They're gonna start taking over the classroom. My students are getting up and walking out and then skateboard guy says, hey, everybody, did you see what happened? You know, this was a lecture on fundamentalism after all. He just waited till the very last second to play the Jesus card, you know, bam, Jesus. Ah, oh, we should have seen this coming. What's wrong with us? And, I, and so I couldn't let that guy have the last word as people are walking out of there. So I, I just go, wait. <laughs> Wait, what, what in the world have you people been learning in here? What, I mean, what, what have you been learning in here? Uh, don't you know that Jesus is the universal religious figure? Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. Everybody wants to take him, maybe, maybe change him up a little bit, and then plunk him down near the center of their religion. See, see having Jesus at the center from the very beginning is actually a very big deal. Uh, take Buddhism, for instance. Uh, Many Buddhists believe that Jesus might very well be a reincarnation of the Buddha himself. If not that, uh, he's a great bodhisattva you know, in, the, in the Mahayana tradition. That's, that's, that's quite a deal. Uh, in, in Hinduism, many Hindus believe that Jesus might very well be an incarnation of the god Vishnu. Uh, if they don't go that far, they would believe like uh, Mohandas K. Gandhi, you know, that, that he was certainly, certainly one of the greatest religious teachers of all time. Islam, for goodness sakes, in Islam, Jesus emerges as a figure greater than Muhammad himself, right? Muhammad is very clear from Islamic tradition 
that Muhammad's a prophet of God. No, no doubt about that. But, but so is Jesus. But in addition, Jesus was in Islamic tradition. Jesus was born of a virgin, was a legitimate miracle worker, and will stand with Allah at the scales of justice at the end of time. I'm not sure of the exact score, but it's something like Muhammad won Jesus for. Uh, this, is, this is to illustrate the idea that, that uh, having Jesus at the center is a big deal. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. So why not start your quest with the religion that has had him firmly planted at the center from the very beginning? I grabbed my stuff off the lectern and I just walked out the side door. I walked to a picnic table and a lunch area, dropped my stuff, took a deep breath and watched students following me out this seldom used door and encircling me. Um, I've had to be escorted off of a couple of college campuses by the campus cops and, uh, this looked like it was shaping up to that, but thank, thank goodness it didn't. Uh, we didn't have much time for Q&A, and it really stimulated their thinking. And so we just kind of had like an all-day seminar at the lunch shack. We were drinking coffee and eating pastries because it was still morning. And then pretty soon it was sandwiches. Uh, I don't know if we actually, we didn't make it to dinner, but uh, maybe afternoon tea or something. I don't know what it was. But, but my goodness, uh, they were hungry for that. They had no idea you could actually think clearly about religion and make decisions uh, on a rational basis. They thought religion was, they were looking for a religion simply to blind leap into. And there were many important other options. Christianity is a standout. It's a standout. In fact, I'll be doing another presentation uh, this afternoon on the uh, historical reliability of the Bible. And this is another comparative enterprise where you go, oh my goodness, I had no idea the Bible had so much evidence going for it. And it's, it's rather dramatic, but that's the case here too. Uh, Christianity is testable. Uh, you get uh, uh, salvation in the system is a free gift from God. We don't make enough of that, by the way. That is a big deal. People don't understand uh, what that really means. We have to get better at communicating that. We have an amazing worldview fit. You get to live a non-compartmentalized life and you get, a, you get the religion that has Jesus at the center from the very beginning. All right. I'll stop there. Thank, thank you for your kind attention.